find yourself saying. Uh, and, uh, of course, book writer. And uh, I've been doing evening classes here for the last sort of eight, nine weeks and um, hoping to make it a kind of semi-permanent little arrangement so uh, I'll be around. Um, as you probably all have been yourselves, when I first started, I got observed by Verinda. And we had a sort of long discussion about various bits and pieces and found that we disagreed about some fundamentals of classroom management stuff, really. And out of the, the kind of discussion that we had about all of that, she asked me if I wanted to do this. So uh, I did. And that's what we're doing here. <laughs> uh, and the, the kind of angle that we decided we were going to go for was a kind of critiquing or rethinking or re-evaluating some of the sort of orthodoxies that maybe you get told and, and maybe even pass on to your own trainees uh, when you kind of get inculcated into ELT. So I've just made a basic list, okay, of uh, ten things. Some of them come from the session I had with Verinda, some of them come from Harmer, and some of them come from Scrivener, from the uh, teacher sort of classroom management sections. So I think what we'll do to begin with, the, the way I kind of like to do it is basically you talk, I talk, we see if there's any time for questions. Does that sound manageable? Okay. The nominate student thing. Um, I mean, obviously, the should and the always are kind of problematic here. Mm. My own feeling is it's something I was trained to do, and it's something I stopped doing, and I hadn't reflected on why I'd stopped doing it until it was really sort of picked up the other week. And I think ultimately I sort of stopped doing it because it's just time consuming and it, it, it's, I kind of like the idea of just things being open for the students and if I have a question I'll ask the whole class and whoever wants to answer will answer. And I'm sort of fine with the fact that some students will answer more than others, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think there's a sort of expectation that everyone has to participate equally all the time and my own feeling is it's just sort of unrealistic to expect that and that some people are quite happy just sitting, maybe they know the answer, but you know, they're quite happy sitting back, not wishing to put themselves forward to take the risk. They'll let the mouthy guy next to them who's wrong 60% of the time kind of shout forward, and then when the teacher says, no, anyone else, and someone else gives the correct answer, they'll kind of sit there and go, ah, I need that one time anyway. And I don't see that as being problematic. Um, I think the other thing is, a lot of the time, unless you're totally sure that the student you're nominating has the correct answer, it can be quite sort of painful in class where you kind of go, well, what do you think? And the students go, um, uh, B? And then you have to sort of go, no, it's not B. Anyone else? And then the student sort of goes further back into their shell. Um, I'm obviously open to the idea it can be done more successfully than that, but my own experience has been that it, it, it's something I sort of tend to avoid, and I think whole class elicitation works better, personally. about reading out sentences. Um, again, for, for me, kind of two things with this. A lot of the time, the sentences that I have on the board have gaps in them, okay? And the reason they've got gaps in them is because I'm going to be kind of doing stuff with them and eliciting language from the students and using them as a roundup. And so obviously it's a bit weird to get a student to read out a sentence with a gap in it, because what do they do with the gap? And even then, once you've written it up on the board, for me, if you want to drill it, drill it. You know, and I think that's a good thing to do generally, and it makes a lot of sense to do that. I've seen a lot of the times when I'm doing observations, and maybe you have too, kind of just teachers asking students to read things out and then sort of saying, good, and wondering what the point of that was. Right. And I think a lot of the time we're sort of encouraged to do it because it increases participation on some kind of level. But it seems like a fairly sort of aimless activity a lot of the time, I think. And... I, it's not drilling or, I don't know, what is it? What's the point of doing it, apart from sort of involving elicitate, involving students in some sort of way, I think. The one about encouraging students to look up words. Mm. Uh, my own feeling about this is, that's what students do already. Okay, and that actually what they pay you to help them do is to give them something better than a dictionary. And that unless 
we're kind of sure of our own ability to provide better input than a dictionary can provide them with. What are we there for? And I think a lot of the time, we kind of persuade ourselves that maybe we're developing student autonomy by telling them to use a dictionary. That's what they did already before they came to our classes, because that's the sort of basic default option that you have when you're a language learner who doesn't have a teacher to ask. And I think there's things that teachers can do with new language which massively outweigh what a dictionary can provide you with. Yeah? Um, teachers can kind of give an example immediately based on the context that there, that's there. You can give parallel examples, you can get extra examples up on the board. You can use the class to add to the extra examples. Um, you can maybe spin out from those extra examples. I think the other thing we often do is we, we sort of moan about students not being very good at using dictionaries. Uh, and a lot of the time I think it's quite difficult to kind of train students to use dictionaries well. Because what do you do? You tell them, try to find the correct meaning of the word. And they go, yeah, 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 that one. Okay, you sure? Yeah, yeah, that one. You sure? Yeah, that one. You go, no, it's actually that one. Next time, try to find the correct meaning by looking at the context, okay? Let's try it again. What do you reckon? That one. You sure? No, it's that one, actually. But basically, once you've told them, you know, you, you need to check if it's a verb or a noun, and you need to try and find the correct meaning, that's it in terms of, you know, using the dictionary. Have a look if there's some examples. They might be useful for you. I think in terms of what you can actually train a student to do with a dictionary, it, it boils down to about three sentences, and you're lucky if most students ever learn those. My suspicion is actually what most students do is use a more bilingual dictionary, and they look at the bilingual translation until one of them makes sense for the context that they're looking it in, if you're lucky, and then they learn that. And obviously it's not a very effective way of doing things, and it's not sort of ideal. But I, I kind of think that one of the main things students pay money for is, is to get better explanations and better examples. And for the teacher to kind of decide, is this something that's worth me spending a little bit of time on? Uh, and is this something that I can kind of add value to what they know already with? Okay? Yeah, if a student asks you about vocabulary, ask them what they think it means. At this point, often when I'm watching lessons, I, I wanted to sort of kill myself because you get stuck in this kind of weird locked dynamic between teacher and student where the student says, what does this word here mean? Well, what do you think it means? I don't know, that's why I'm asking you. Well, I'm asking you because I want to involve you in the process of creating the meaning. Oh, fuck it, I'll just look it up in the dictionary. And it's really easy to slip into that, I think. Um, or what else I often see teachers do is to kind of do the concept question thing before they bother to explain it. So they'll kind of go, what do you think it means? Is it good or bad? And the student go, well, I'm guessing bad, but that doesn't really tell me what the word actually means. Um, and I also think what often happens is, if you just ask, what do you think it means? You get synonyms, okay? Um, I was in Russia a couple of weeks ago doing this sort of advanced class, and watching Russian teachers teach was really interesting, because often what they'll do is, Someone will ask what a word means, they'll ask the group what the word means, and they get ten synonyms back. So they get something like arrogant, and they'll say, yeah, what does arrogant mean? Conceited, big-headed, overbearing. And you go, right, so there's four words now which they kind of know, but they don't know the difference between, or they may not know the difference between. You've opened this kind of can of synonym worms. What are you going to do with all of this? And I think a lot of the time what teachers do is to kind of go, yeah, good, it's sort of something like that. And I think... It's, it's not a very good question asking them what it means because you get into the synonym trap or you get into the locked I don't know kind of trap. And I think generally if students are kind of asking you what things mean, what they mean is can you please show me how to use this word in the context in which I'm seeing it here. Okay? And I think that's slightly different to just give me a basic meaning. It's a sort of, you know, can you show me what you can do with this word as it's being used here. The concept questions, I kind of feel this has been massively uh, abused and misused and taken from grammar and massively over-applied to vocab. I've got no beef at all about concept questions being used to check grammar that's come up in a context or something. 
But concept questions basically only really work for a few grammar structures, I think. So if you've got your present perfect simple sentence and you're doing the kind of, did it happen in the past, present or future? Past, do we know when? No. Is there a present result? Yes. That works fine. You know, that kind of clarifies the meaning basically, assuming the meaning's already apparent in the first place. Yeah? With vocabulary, it's really, really hard to ask concept questions which nail it. Um, I was looking through the, the old Scrivener yesterday, the um, learning teaching, the one that I had on my CELTA course back in the 90s. And there's a great example in there where he has get kicked out of, okay? And the sentence was something like he got kicked out of the team. And you're encouraged to ask before dealing with the meaning, was he in the team before? Yes. Is he in the team now? No. And that somehow that checks the concept. Uh, there's any number of things that that could still mean. Yeah, it could mean he decided to leave the team. It could mean he was promoted out of the team into the first team. Um, it could mean he was suspended from the team. Yeah, there's nothing in those questions that kind of nails or clarifies the meaning. And I think by kind of insisting on those closed yes, no CCQ things with vocabulary, it stops us maybe thinking about better questions we could ask. Yeah. And, you know, if you're kind of explaining, well, if you get kicked out of the team, it means you're asked to leave the team because you do something wrong. You give an example, you know, you got kicked out of the team for being late for training all the time. You ask the students any other reasons why you get kicked out of a team. That's how you find out if they know what the word means or not. If they all just sit there still and kind of go, <laughs> basketball, then you know that they haven't kind of grasped it. And that's not really a concept question. That, that's a sort of expanding upon the example question. And I think it's much more effective than, than, the, than, than the kind of just closed yes-no question. The roundup activities, this is something I was taught to do myself, and maybe you were, and I still don't really understand why. It seems to me to be, I like what you said, which is, you know, you like to kind of at least feign interest in something that the students have been saying. Very much feigning, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't taking this as a person, yeah, the general view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it often does kind of do that. I think my, my feeling is it's what teachers do to round things up when they can't think of anything else to do a lot of the time. And you don't want to just kind of say, right, stop, now page 42 and some grammar. So you, you kind of try and do something that wraps it up. Um, my own feeling is it's good to try and at least find some interest in what they've said, but there are better ways of doing it. I, I guess for myself, what, what I ended up replacing it with was board work and kind of looking at how to say what the students have been trying to say better and kind of retelling some of their stories, getting bits and pieces up on the board and then sort of going, I heard a couple of really interesting things from some of you. So, you know, you're still doing the kind of, you're so fascinating, all of you interesting people. But you're also kind of bringing it back to language teaching, bringing it back to, and here's how to say some of those things better so that next time if you ever want to say those things, you can say them even more interestingly and I think it kind of it's something to do with the kind of ebb and flow of that relationship between when the students have the class and when the teacher has the class and it kind of brings it back to the teacher brings it back to some language and maybe makes the students feel that there was a point to the speaking because the point then is when we do speaking the teacher helps us to say some of the things we tried to say and shows us how to do that in better English if the point is Great, you two had a really interesting discussion. Would you care to summarise it for us? Oh. Yeah, I guess I could do. And now, would you two care to? You know, by the time you get here, uh, these guys are already asleep or wondering why they can't understand what this person's talking about. It, it just seems to me to be a very kind of slow grind, kind of low reward, low value kind of way of wrapping things. TTT thing. Uh, sounds like most people have sort of moved on from probably what you were told on your own training courses. I don't know how many of you were given the number, the, the kind of 60-40, 70-30 kind of thing. Mental. I, it, it just completely obscures any sensible discussion about what the value of teacher talking time is. I suspect people get told it on CELTA courses because 
people waffle a lot and you panic and you kind of self-narrate and you do the whole kind of, now I'm just going to pick up the handouts and then I'm going to give it to you and now I'm giving, you know, you do that kind of nervous jabbering. And I guess the shorthand way that we deal with that is to sort of tell people, keep your TTT to a minimum. But for me, you know, you'd never go into a geography class and, and, and sort of tell them only 40% teacher talking time. L1, don't know if IH has a policy on this at all. Um, it's funny because uh, being in Russia the other week, a lot of Russian teachers are still working in institutions where they're, they're basically told they can't use their own first language, which seems insane to me because you've got bilingual teachers teaching monolingual students where those teachers know all of the problems and pitfalls that their students are going to have learning English because they've been through them themselves and some monolingual native speaker has persuaded them not to use one of their great assets. Um, my own feeling is, it obviously depends, but I think kind of principled use of L1 should be kind of built in to, to good practice. And I think kind of two-way translation, getting students to translate sentences in and out of their first languages, even if they're all from different language backgrounds, and even if you speak none of those languages, it's still a really useful thing to do. Um, I think also sometimes what you realise is when students are talking L1 to each other, it's because they're helping each other. Yeah, it's often just because, you know, the slow one's stuck over here and is kind of shouting out to the other Spanish, Chinese, French speakers, whatever, what's the teacher want us to do? Page 42. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no French, please. You know, no French means person X sitting here is just stuck there, kind of not a clue what's going on. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it depends. And I think also, obviously, sometimes... When students are speaking, if they're speaking to someone else who shares their first language, when they get stuck, they'll use L1. Or when they get carried away, they'll use L1. Um, for me, possibly for many of you as well, that, that just seems like a good opportunity to kind of teach something. And you ask them, well, what's that you're trying to say? And then they try and say it, and you say, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. We'll come back to it later. Um, but, you know, banning it, uh, as with all things, just sort of drives it underground, I think. Um, <laughs> Never teach straight from the course book. Oh. Don't know how many of you were told this on your CELTA course. I, I was. And it's sort of like a meaningless sentence to me, really, because it depends what you're doing when you're teaching the course book. You know, there, there are a, a thousand and one things that any teacher could do when they pick up the course book. And because of what I do, where I'm kind of doing teacher training and writing and stuff, I see a lot of teachers teach the same units. Uh, and so was out in Poland last year and we watched about 10 teachers in a week all teach the same unit of intermediate. It was really weird. <laughs> and they all do it completely differently. You know, that they all kind of, some of them do it much better than others. Some of them are much more focused on the language that's there. They're much more kind of adept at picking stuff up and exploring it. Some of the best ones I saw basically start at number one and work through and go to number 10. But they're bouncing off the language and the students all the time and they're kind of leaving space for the students by exploring the language, you know, get kicked up might come up, they might ask the group any other reasons why you get kicked out, in pairs quickly, have you ever known anyone get kicked out of anywhere, why, what happens, they'll work with what comes back, then they'll do the next exercise. You know, they're basically teaching straight from the course book but they're also teaching the group and they're also teaching the language. Number 10, uh, it's rubbish. It, it, there are no learning styles, and the whole thing is now basically discredited. Um, I think this whole notion has been really damaging to CELTA courses and to ELT over the last kind of 20 years. All of the, the research into how the brain actually works and what goes on when you're learning things would seem to suggest that we all learn different things in a multiplicity of different ways that you learn physical things physically and you learn intellectual things intellectually. Uh, and this whole left brain, right brain, Gardner, multiple intelligences stuff has essentially been a sort of very clever construct which has been used to sell lots of stuff to people. And I think also it becomes a kind of default defence mechanism for people. Yeah, I think a lot of the time 
people use it to protect themselves from things they don't want to do. I'm guessing you teach a lot of Saudis and that sometimes they're doing IELTS. Do you have those kids? Yeah? Okay. I need you to do IELTS 6.5 <laughs> by next February. And you go, right, not a chance. <laughs> and I was at a conference last year about learning styles. Jim Scrivener was talking. And I was talking to a Saudi woman afterwards and she said, oh, this is very good for me because, you know, we Saudis, we are oral, oral people. So going, you keep telling yourself that and your students will keep failing IELTS because it stops them from writing and it stops you from addressing the fact that they need to learn to write. And you can sit there and kind of go, oh, no, I said, writing, I don't really like writing. I'm, I'm oral, oral myself. My, that's my learning style teacher, OK? So, you know, you have to just deal with that. And I think often it, it kind of persuades us to, to, to not be as hard on students as perhaps they need us to be in order for them to get what they need to do done. And that sometimes, you know, the hard truths are, yeah, you might think you are, and that, that might be what you'd prefer me to let you do. But if you need to pass IELTS, you need to write. This is a bit of paper. This is called a pen. Try and use it, and I want to see some homework from you next week. And, you know, they won't immediately thank you for that all the time. But if they're going to learn to write, it can't be oral, oral. Um, and the same kind of way, I think, it's just any classroom, you're doing this anyway. You're doing some listening, you're doing some speaking, you're doing a bit of moving around. They'll be doing some reading, they'll be doing a little bit of writing down in the course book. So, you know, all bases covered. Uh, and if you're hoping to teach grammar kinesthetically or, 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 or you know, writing oral, orally or something, I, I would suggest it's sort of wildly optimistic.